What's up, buddy? How's it going, buddy? <laughs> it's good, dude. I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so how you been, man? Uh, doing well, man. Alive and well. Staying afloat. Um, happy birthday to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I'm how so stoked to talk to you, dude. I see, I see the social posts. I see the beautiful ladies. I see the oh, nightlife. Okay. Like, what is going on? Like, so tell everybody, like, what you're doing right now, like your name, like what you do, that kind of gig. Right. So I'm I'm Xander Farr. Um, I do a lot of different things in music, but I sort of started as a drummer where we met and then started producing events and opening concert venues. That led me to... Uh, do that in a few different states, North Carolina, Texas, California, and York. Um, and I started working with festivals uh, like Sundance and South by and Coachella and EDC and Bonnaroo and a uh, bunch of others. And uh, I started working with uh, startups and brands and products that were launching. And uh, while I was throwing this event series, this party series at South by Southwest called, called Lose Control. I uh, met this guy who was starting a ticketing company called The Ticket Ferry, and he and I sort of discussed his endeavors and uh, joined forces, and I started to help build that uh, company with him. Um, and so over the last five years or so, I've just been bouncing around between projects, uh, producing a few different events, the Lose Control event at South By. Um, I also produce the American Beatbox Championships and run a brand called American Beatbox uh, with a few other people. And then... Uh, uh, these different projects, different festivals uh, alongside these two main um, events and the ticketing company. <laughs> Um, sort of my, my main base, uh, home base items, I guess, a few of my main irons in the fire. Awesome, man. So, uh, let's go way back and talk about your childhood, your siblings, your parents and, uh, okay. all that. um, I'm from Hilton Head Island. I was born down there. Um, actually born in Savannah, but taken back across the. Charlotte. Um, I was a drummer. I was given my first drum set when I was a toddler. So I was, was a drummer at heart and in my mind. Um, and then I just started to explore other genres uh, through drums. I explored swing and jazz and funk and uh, different groove um, patterns and Latin jazz and other things. Uh, and then into high school, I was on the marching band and drum line and I was on the step team. I was the only only white guy on the step team and probably the whole history, uh, at least anywhere nearby. We never came across another one, but uh, I always had an affinity for rhythm and groove and dancing and sort of everything that goes along with uh, sort of the drums, right? And that, uh, that rhythmic um, lifestyle. So I uh, played in bands. And then when I went to, uh, to college, I started expanding more. But I got a few sisters. I have kind of a really modern family situation. Uh, I have an older sister. We share a mom. Uh, one younger sister, we share a dad. And my other younger sister was married into the family. But we're all, you know, all one family. Uh, they're all my sisters as I see them. There's not really any more delineation than that. And love them all dearly. Uh, they're all married. And I'm the crazy Uncle X running around festivals and backstages and etc. <laughs> awesome. So what were you like in high school? Uh, you know, I, I was just such a drummer always when I was younger. It was just such a defining characteristic of me. Um, but I've always just been very outgoing and extroverted and love to meet new people and talk a lot about ideas. Um, I studied a lot of 
uh, religion and philosophy. Uh, when I was in high school, I kind of started to question a lot of things and uh, read up on all of the different ideologies and philosophy. Question a lot of the parameters of reality, you know, through university taking classes in psychology and philosophy and um, always just kind of leaned in that path, I guess. So, uh, maybe I was a little bit weird <laughs> in that sense. Nah, um, but I always was very intrigued with, um, kind of the human condition and the way people respond to things and the way people are advertised to and marketed to. I always used to watch, um, infomercials when I was a kid for, for some weird reason. But I was very, uh, very into them. And uh, I loved kind of breaking down how um, people were sold items and the, the tone of voice that was used and uh, just sort of all the tricks of the trade. Anyway, I kind of was always very interested in that. So kind of always had a marketing edge and was very much the business oriented one in the bands that I played in. You know, I was making the flyers and trying to book the shows and organized practice and all that kind of stuff. Typical drummer stuff, I think. Uh, the older I've gotten, I've realized drummers tend to be the organizational component of many band projects. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, you said, but, so when did you say you got your first drum, drum set for? Yeah, I think I was like three or four. My dad got it for me and I was never really always kind of a joke in a question of uh, his motives behind getting me that drum set. But <laughs> Um, my mom really loved that I had it. I think she embraced it, which I'm very thankful for because I was living with her and growing up there. And so um, a young boy learning to play the drums has got to be right up there with one of the most annoying things, I would imagine, my, my sonically. Son, my son right now is pretty much like he goes to my my father's house and plays on the drum set. And, you know, my wife is like, no, we are not getting... We're not getting a drum <laughs> Oh man. Yeah, but I keep trying to talk her into it, but she's not she's not down so far. But lucky for us now, we electric have drum like sets. electronic yeah. drums, yeah, really good pads and stuff. You know, my neighbors even Headphones. I had I remember as a kid, <laughs> I had issues with my neighbors kind of complaining in the afternoons, you know, that I was still playing drums. I would come home from school and I would just play drums for hours and hours. Uh, I had a neighbor that was a guitar player. And so when I was in, I guess I was in like middle school and really probably into high school when I got into uh, metal drumming and, you know, more of the, with being exposed to marching band, I feel like the marching band world is very technical. And so a lot of those, um, drummers are into the very technical genres of music like progressive rock and um and you know sort of different versions of metal um and so yeah you know i would just come home and try in those high school years to just get faster on double bass you know and just sit on my drum set for two hours going right left 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 <laughs> right and then trying to do paradiddles and doing all of like the different rudiments that you would try you know that you would practice on your hands i'd be practicing them on my feet and i can only imagine the neighbors would just hear you know for two hours just you know yeah. no uh no consistency no pattern just really trying to learn so i mean and then it would of course progress to something much more tolerable like blast beats you know on drums <laughs> which uh i don't really blame them, i guess later on but i have some fond memories of um very angry neighbors <laughs> with uh with really funny comments to make about so, so you were the you were the dennis the menace like, oh, I mean, to a to degree. I mean, there were definitely other aliens in the neighborhood, but to the people that lived directly right around me, uh, you know, they all knew that once the noise started, it wasn't going to stop anytime real soon. <laughs> awesome. So was music always like prevalent in your house, your parents blasting it all the time? Yeah, my mom is, uh, she was a backup singer. 
and oh. she was the quintessential, you know, like singing into the wooden spoon while cooking dinner. Um, and so on my mom's side, we're very vocal, singing, dancing. Um, and my dad too, you know, my dad really loved El around him always singing Elvis and um, learning some of the, the other old bluesy stuff. So yeah, music was definitely fed to me and, and has always been a part of my family's interest and we always had music on, um, you know, and then I sort of have taken a path of exploring music and have never really stopped. You know, I, I used to have really strong tastes, I think when I was younger, uh, specifically like and dislike things. Um, but the more I've worked in music over my life and understood the requirements, you know, of different components of an, an event or whatever deal, um, you know, I've started to be more open minded and listen to music, I think, a lot differently or with a different set of ears on, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, and so also as a drummer, I always kind of um, loved anything that had a good backbeat to it you know anything that was groove oriented i could get down with it especially if i had a little funky groove oriented beat or whatever um but yeah more so now i really appreciate all types of genre um and still especially stuff that's more groove oriented and funky i think that's kind of my leaning um favorite genres you know hip-hop funk soul uh that kind of stuff yeah that's awesome uh so so after high school did you go to college yeah, so uh, I did. Yep, went to UNCW and I studied communications uh, as a major and psychology and music performance as minors. Awesome. So uh, what were some of the, the major obstacles in your uh, academic career that you had to, to get through to, to get, you know, get your degree? Uh for me, probably the biggest obstacle going into university was the hurdle of getting over my own assured state of mind that I was going to tour the world as a famous drummer and that school was just going to be something I was going to get through, um, you know, so that I had the backup plan of a, a degree and that my parents were happy. I have uh, no idea what you're talking about, Xander. Catered my, my school experience at the university level I really catered it to to work for my music schedule. And so I, I took like Tuesday, Thursday classes only like all the years that I went to school basically <laughs> so I could have the weekends to go on tour. Um, and then I think one of the other, probably the biggest hurdle uh, in those years and maybe of my life was uh, I had a really bad car accident um, where I was hit by a drunk driver when I was 21. And that sort of took me from playing with bands as the only future um, and got me started thinking about other potential ways to be involved in the music business, um, not just as a touring drummer. Um, and, you know, I'm thankful for that in many ways because it opened a ton of doors and that has become a passion. And I've been able to reach a lot of people in ways that being a touring drummer would have not uh, allowed. Um, and, but yeah, that was, th those were probably a couple of the big hurdles. I mean, any band is difficult. Um, as, as you know, there's a lot of people in there. There's a lot of emotions. Everybody is a different personality. Everybody has a girlfriend or a boyfriend or an ex or both, um, you know, and money issues and, lifestyle concerns um you know so there's just a whole lot of dynamics there and i think when i look back to my university years my uh my mindset in the in those years was really like this is the time that we are most free of anything you know we don't have the families we don't have the kids we don't really have the debt we don't have um the pressures you know we can really jump in and do this and I tried to really be the driving force in those projects. But I, I think um, one thing I learned when I came out to California is that, you know, everybody out here is playing in six, seven. 
for the one project out of the group that they play with, uh, different groups that they play with to blow up, right? So that they go on tour with that one. They're kind of hedging their bets in a sense. And I grew up with a very blood, sweat and tears. Let's buy a van and live in that motherfucker and drive around the world, you know, and play show after show until we become famous or until we bleed and die from it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that, that, dedication i think was a, a hurdle for me really back in the day because i when opportunities came to leave to go to other states or to join other projects across the country or whatever i was definitely more hesitant and thinking more along the lines of i've i've built this project with these guys these are my brothers you know we're gonna we're gonna make this happen um you know and i i believe still that that is the way that you should treat you know sort of the, the situations but um you know, opportunities come in and sometimes once in a lifetime and um, different opportunities present very different lifestyles and pathways. So um, I think just remaining clear headed and, and everything, it's, it's a hurdle that that time of life is crazy for anybody. You know, you're going through a lot of different uh, changes in life and freedoms and exploring that freedom. So, so what happened in the car accident? Uh, so I was going out for a surf weekend there was a hurricane hitting the outer banks and there were I've double never overhead done that. i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> so we're like storm swell woo um and uh some of my old roommates who then had been had moved to pennsylvania were going to drive down and we were going to drive up and i uh was going to pick up a girl that i was seeing at the time after she finished her shift at work and uh, on the way to pick her up, a drunk driver ran a red light and T-boned me in an intersection. Mm. And it was a really bad accident. I like woke up in the ambulance briefly and then woke up in the hospital after surgery the next day and um, crushed my right ankle, which was my bass drum foot mm. and had lots of ligament damage and muscle damage up through my leg and my back and neck and arms um, kind of got thrown around the vehicle a lot. I'm really lucky to be alive from it actually. Um, and I'm very appreciative of life uh, ever since in, in a very different way. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it essentially, it took me out of being able to play. I had to drop out of school that semester um, and it was a bad, And a few months after that in a wheelchair and then about a six month period of uh, recovery and, and rehabilitation. And by that point it had been about a year and I was feeling a little bit better about the 11th month or so, 10th month um, after the accident, I had started gaining a little more um, momentum and I rode my motorcycle at the time and uh, another vehicle backed out of a driveway into me around going around a curve didn't stop and look luckily i didn't really get very hurt that time i just i did ditch the vehicle and like rolled off the side of the road and it sort of just set back all of that rehabilitation i'd spent six months doing um so i spent another year in physical therapy after that and um i started going back to school that spring semester before that happened and it wasn't bad enough to keep me out of that fall semester so i was able to go back to school and finish um get my degree but during that time while i was trying to play music again which was pretty physically painful especially with the ankle um and then just the endurance to be able to hold your posture and play drums uh especially rock drums you know uh, for a long time difficult process but i started to unfold the idea of creating an event company some friends had uh started bringing me out to some clubs and shows and stuff and i never really liked to go to dance clubs before that um but once i started going out and seeing the good time i kind of uh thought about bringing bands and bringing djs and doing shows and having that be uh, sort of something that could keep me close to the music industry uh, at least through that rehabilitation time, right? And and through that healing process and recovery process. So that was kind of the impetus for me starting my company. Entrepreneurial endeavor. I'd always 
been an entrepreneur since very young, um, but it was my first event company. And uh, so, yeah, that was, that was the company that I started kind of right as I was graduating. Hmm. So who had, uh, did you have a professor or a teacher that had the most impact on you um, when you were in college? Um, I had a few that, that come to mind, I think for different reasons. Um, Rick Olson, communications department and then actually became the communications chair um and he at one point he was a musician he is a musician also and actually i was really lucky because i was a communications major and my core classes were all um these guys that were in a band together uh called the schoolboys actually and uh it was really it was really funny they're a great kind of like an old um uh, rock and roll cover band basically but they really understood my passion for playing music and for um, you know balancing the workload of school so I was very lucky to have all of them really but Rick um, really exposed me to the concepts of making a living as a musician as a songwriter not just a touring drummer you know and and I think growing up I just had it in my mind I was going to be like Aerosmith or you know, one of these bands that just forevermore, we will be in this band together, you know, through thick and thin ups and downs, we'll just have, uh, that will be the lifestyle. Um, and going through the school process, he very early on, it was my freshman year, actually, one of the first meetings that we had just um, as, a, as a teacher advisor, um, he put, put me on game, you know, he showed me a couple websites where you could post music that you had made or uh, recorded and could sell it to, um, you know, pilot TV shows or commercials or all these ty types of ways that you can basically monetize uh, songwriting, you know? Mm -hmm. So he was a major, major influence for me um, for many reasons. Also definitely in the music department, uh, Gerald Shinette, who uh, is a trombone player and a piano player who's toured with Chick Corea and has a laundry list of really, uh, really great credits for his music wow. career. But he was an amazing jazz instructor and he was so hardcore. If you've ever seen, um, oh, I'm gonna forget the movie. Uh, there's a movie made about uh, a drummer Whiplash? or a drum. What was it? Whiplash. Whiplash. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. that. Was basically in music, uh, throwing symbols and like yelling across the stop. No, he was, he was really great though. Um, he taught me a lot of patience in, in my approach to music. And um, at a time where I had come from jazz and swing and then explored all of these genres of hip hop and rock and metal and sort of found this heaviness to my playing, this power um, through my, my university uh, learning experiences and, and, music classes with him and um with some others you know i kind of dialed that back a lot and learned a lot of a lot about tact you know mm -hmm. and and how to listen to the band and really come at it from a composer point of view as the drummer looking at the score of the song actually and thinking of everybody's part and how you can accent everything going on not just be a backbeat or even be you know a, a predominant force necessarily but really just be a net um, to the music. And so he was very influential. Um, and then probably the other one I would identify is, um, a philosophy teacher that I had. He was also my logic instructor, uh, a guy called Ferenc Altreichter. Um, he was this Hungarian professor who, though, if you've ever taken logic classes, you know, it's very math based, um, and I'm a very logical person in, in many ways, especially in form, forming arguments and debating and these kind of things. So I took to logic like a fish to water. I really loved it. And he also taught these classes, um, philosophy of the mind and some other courses that were sort of left field philosophy courses, uh, I would say. But it, it was, he was first and foremost, he was gripping because of his accent. Um, you know, he was this older Hungarian guy. And, and so when he would speak, he was like, yes, yes. So when we speak about this philosophy, 
what is it that we are really suggesting here with the, you know, orchestrated speaker, you know, it was just, uh, it was music to my ears. So I love just listening to him talk about anything, especially these really crazy concepts that, uh, you know, we would take back and uh, discuss among, among bandmates over, um, you know, different substances and uh, <laughs> talk about all sorts of fun theories, you know. Um, so those are probably some of my, my most influential, definitely um, the whole of the communications department teachers who, especially the ones that were in the schoolboys band, because uh, those four guys were just really, um, they really helped, you know, kind of usher me through navigating that experience, I guess, of going to school and trying to be a musician and also uh, finding that dedication and, and what I'm supposed to do. Awesome. Uh, how to make it all balance out. Yeah, that's, 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 that's cool. That's good. To, that's, that's very fortunate to have a major that's not music to have professors who are <laughs> all in a band, essentially. I know. Yeah, it was really, uh, it was a, it was a special experience and they're a great band too. They're a lot of fun and um, yeah, it definitely, it definitely lended to my experience as a musician going through university. I was lucky. Awesome. So you said right after college, you started in a, your own event company, right? Um, yep. So what happened after that? Like what happened with that company and led you that what led you into the next venture as well? So I started Zandali Productions and I was doing uh, club photography, videography and concerts. And the photography and videography side was my events to be shot and covered um so i had I, I bought a camera you know i bought a nice video camera um so that we could set up and, and capture these events and also film like our promotions i used to do time lapse graffiti um against these big walls of the details of the event you know um so i bought you know these cameras and then i wanted to use them so i just um was working with different clubs and finding ways to utilize camera equipment, right? So as I started to work with the more clubs, um, you know, uh, sort of a system developed and I got referred to a few other people who were opening concert venues and I started booking shows for those venues. Um, and then and Dolly presents shows. Um, and eventually I sort of hit a ceiling in a small Bible Belt beach town, um, where the sense of, the consensus of the powers that be uh, were not very excited about having concerts on a regular basis, where young kids who had been intoxicated were spilling into the streets late at night. Um, so that kind of prompted me to reevaluate the longer term. Of uh, I loved living at the beach and I loved being in that environment, but I was basically going to be restricted. I had a lower ceiling uh, for the for the success that I could potentially have. So uh, I started working in New York a little bit. I started traveling up to New York, um, filming some shows up there and, and photographing some events uh, and then following some bands that I had helped book on routed tours through Wilmington and doing some things with them and sort of it uh, opened a door to go to South by Southwest one year. Um, after having spent a few months trying to launch a concert venue and the owner of that concert venue pulling out entirely, claiming bankruptcy, um, it sort of was the, the move that made the most sense. Go to South by Southwest, be there for two weeks and uh, just get away from this experience and you know, figure it out when I get back kind of thing, right? So I went down there and... Um, over those two weeks, I met so many brand people, um, companies, artists, uh, just it was an uh, amazing experience. Uh, definitely uh, recommend anyone go to South by Southwest and events like that. It's just such an amazing um, interactive experience. But I met a lot of people there who were interested in getting me involved in the projects they had going on. Uh, well, I was just opening this new concert venue and the guy just claimed bankruptcy. So I'm not really sure what my next move is. 
So the people who had exciting things going on were like, oh, come to California, come to New York, come to Seattle, you know, meet with us, talk about this, talk about that and see if, you know, there's any crossover. So I did a bunch of that for a month or so. And I kind of decided to form this company with uh, some people who worked with Skull Candy for a while. Uh, and the company that we were forming was called Peerless Group. And our, um, our job basically was to seed, gift, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, these influencers with products um, from different companies, lifestyle companies usually, who wanted to try to create an alignment um, or do some promotion with uh, these influencers, these artists or whatever. So I moved to California and basically uh, threw caution to the wind, um, came out and just started this company with three other guys and really it was a, it was a really wild time, honestly. Um, experiential marketing hadn't really become what it is now. And so we were, you know, basically as YouTube was just also becoming some, you know, something, uh, and Instagram was really taking hold as well and just becoming something hashtags were a new thing, you know? So we started early in, in that phase and just, it was this zeitgeist where, companies, lifestyle companies, which tons of them are grown in Orange County and in LA County, Southern California. And uh, we were working with them to take their product and, and gift it to these big DJs or rappers or whomever, uh, famous artists, influencers, and sort of helping put these deals together, uh, whereby the, the platform, going on, you know, a limo ride and partying with the sponsored liquor brand and, you know, doing indoor skydiving and, you know, X, Y, Z, crazy other experiences with these influencers, everything captured on camera, of course, so that we could turn around that content. And that content is brought to you by the liquor brand, right? Or whomever. Um, so it was very, it was a fun way to get introduced to California for sure. <laughs> Um, and coming from the music industry and just having been a musician, uh, you know, I always felt and have always felt like uh, all the musicians and DJs and, and other people that I work with and, and around are really more peers than anything. We, we come from the same cloth. You know, we are creatives. We are artists. Um, life takes everybody in different paths, you know. And uh, so I've always looked at them that way. And it's just been a very, uh, it, it was a fun ride anyway. It was a, it was a great transition um, which brought me back around um, into something that was a lot of fun where I didn't necessarily need to be a performer. Um, because certainly when I was throwing events, um, there was always in my mind sort of a, a time where I would go back to just playing um, or at least balancing one, you know, the, the, the both of them. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was kind of the, the first transition was going to South by Southwest, meeting all these people and just realizing that there's all this opportunity. And a lot of people, frankly, wanted to wanted to hire me and wanted to give me working opportunities. Um, and so I, I kind of just got into a yes man mentality and uh, opened the doors and said, all right, you know, you want to pay for me to go to this place and do this thing? Let's go. Uh, you want to hire me to go on tour and do this thing? Let's go. Um, and it, it really, keeping that mentality has these from there. That's awesome. That sounds, man, that sounds crazy. Like being able to wild. <laughs> indoor skydiving and all that stuff. That's, that's nuts. Yeah. So, the footage uh, back, it's funny to come across some of those old footage pieces and I'm just like, oh man, uh, just, uh, <laughs> what, what crazy. you couldn't get away with that now, you know, you, Uh, because the, the algorithms have all changed, um, you know, but yeah, it was a wild time. <laughs> That's funny. So, uh, so tell us what you're doing now, like, like in, in your new venture and uh, other projects that you're currently working on and, and what do you want for your, the, the future of your business and uh, any other ventures you want to get into? Yeah. So, um, you know, Zandali is kind of still the, Um, you know, after moving to California uh, and 
Uh, I then went to New York and started opening concert venues there and open concert venues in Texas after that uh, and went and started producing these events at South by um, and started producing the American beatbox championships and started with the ticket ferry. So right now the, the current, you know, situation is basically spinning plates. Um, the ticket ferry is my main squeeze. Uh, I got involved with them a little over five years ago. Uh, and it is likened to an event, right? But is more like a sales force for managing, uh, the business end of the events. Um, and also, helps to sort of hack uh, the promotion and discovery of that event, of your events or whatever. Really cool platform. I've been very uh, excited to build that over the last five years and we just launched our public signup this year. So um, that's something that is, is definitely uh, a light and uh, leading the way for my efforts. Um, and then I'm also working on this American Beatbox brand, producing the American Beatbox Championships. Um, and building this brand American Beatbox, which um, beatboxing, most people kind of think of the Fat Boys or Rozelle or Dougie Fresh or some of these older uh, guys, and they kind of view it as a side stage kitschy thing. But this community is crazy globally, and they're just so incredibly talented. So it's been something that I've been working on for the last four years, um, and I really am excited about building that. And we're expanding to new events and doing live streams and have a YouTube channel. And so, um, so, so those are my the, two. What are the events like that you've been doing with the beatbox stuff? Uh, it's like a, well, a beatbox battle or a beatbox competition is kind of like a breakdancing battle, right? It's kind of like a bracket style. Goes up against another person and just like a breakdance battle um, or a scratch battle, you know, they're just essentially trying to flex on one another and show what they can do um, through their ability to, to make certain sounds, to be consistent with sounds, um, to keep in time while they're going, and also to show some musicality in what they're doing. Um, so there are judging points and everything. And it's really, it's a crazy fun event. And, and the community is very, very tight knit. They're very engaged. They all watch each other's videos. Everybody is very supportive. Um, and it's growing a lot from where it has been, which is kind of a small niche place. Um, and just in the four years, you know, that we've been doing stuff, uh, we've, we've seen a lot of growth. And it was at a time where the American Beatbox Championships event was risking uh, being halted essentially it wasn't going to continue anymore and so we stepped in and um, have continued it and decided to build a brand american beatbox around it um and and make that a platform for um you know all of the americas north america central america south america and all of the beatboxers and beatboxing communities and events and competitions that are in the americas uh to kind of uh, shine a light on them and and help drive some visibility uh, and just build the scene. So uh, it's it's a crazy it's a crazy event. Uh, definitely go check out AmericanBeatbox.com um, and check out our YouTube channel and stuff. It, I mean, you'll be really shocked. And I would almost bet money that anybody who at least at least if you watch three videos that uh, by the end of that third video, you'll catch yourself beatboxing and trying sounds and doing, even if it's subconsciously, um, it is it is worse than uh, Herp from Vegas. You know, you're never gonna get rid of it. After you try a little, little of this beatboxing on, it's gonna be with you forever. <laughs> <laughs> so I bet you've seen some crazy talented people doing uh, doing the beatbox stuff. Did you get that? Sorry. You broke up a little bit there. You said, uh, bet, bet I've seen some what? Some crazy talented beatboxers out there oh, doing this. Oh, man. These kids are just, you don't believe that all of this sound is coming from one person in the moment and live. You know, you even when you watch the videos, I think that the, the tendency is to doubt that this is real, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, there are just amazing, amazing talents out there all around the world and they all have different styles but it is a language it's like it's very much like music in in every way you know or sports or other creative mediums um 
where you know you have this common language within that creative medium and mm -hmm. so it doesn't or what your background is or culture or any of the uh, surface differences you know when these beatboxers no matter where they are from around the world when they come together and even in watching each other online um, they all can watch someone make a sound and then practice making that sound themselves until they get it right and then incorporate it into their own pool of knowledge uh, that they can pull from and and uh, and be creative with so That's it's nice. definitely very you know, have a, a high affinity for, for working in, in this group because they're just very talented, very, very talented. And I see a lot of, a lot of potential success in the future for this growth, you know? Awesome. Well, shout out that website one more time. Yeah, that's AmericanBeatbox.com and uh, on Instagram, uh, American Beatbox and YouTube, American Beatbox. Sick. Yeah, I'm definitely going to go watch that because uh, I'm yeah, a closet I, beatboxer. I'm sure you are. Our, I know you are too. <laughs> oh man well you know as a drummer it's always been it's funny because um you know the community of beatboxers are very protective of their uh of their art form right and you know as as all creative community members are they don't want outsiders to come in and ruin it or to exploit it you know and so um it's funny because in my experience as a drummer there is a language that drummers use and you you can attest to this you've played with a lot of drummers and drummers have to speak this language to everybody else in the band because otherwise you're just hitting the drums really, really loud in a small practice room and everybody gets very annoyed quickly. Um, you know, so we have this kind of language that is kind of like scat in a sense, you know, like the old jazz scatting, but uh, we just sort of speak the drum sounds like, okay, I'm gonna do a boom, tika, tika, boom, tika, 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 right? And, but in beatboxing, you would never really go, digga, 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 shh, you know? You would actually make uh, it sound like a drum set. <laughs> it would, yeah, the, the, the audible, you know, the phonics of it would be much different, much more uh, effort behind it. Always having that language as a part of my daily experience of life, um, it was always something I was close to. And I was aware of beatboxing, and I would try to do like the Razel, um, if your mother only knew is like mm -hmm. one of the famous ones that he did while he's beatboxing and saying the words, singing the words. Um, so I used to try that when I was young and I just, I never was aware of this niche community of hardcore beatboxers who are really pushing the envelope of, uh, of the sounds and the, the creative measures, you know? So once I came, became aware of that through uh, a friend, Mark Martin, um, who, is a former champion and, and world renowned beatboxer, lots of credits to his name. Um, he sort of brought me into that world more, showed me more about what was going on, became more aware of the battle scene and, and sort of what was happening. And then uh, within a few years of meeting him and knowing him, we got offered or sort of through Kayla and Mark, uh, who got the offer to take over the champs, you know, we sort of uh, became partners on that, given my experience with events and production and logistics and uh, sponsors and other things like that. So uh, it's something that I'm very, my heart is close to it. You know, I, I definitely am the type of person I like to do uh, things that I love. I like to put my skills to use in communities that uh, I feel some sort of affinity for. Um, it's definitely not all about the money, you know, um, and this community is, uh, is a great one. I don't think there's a huge pot of gold for us at the end, but it's something that is so wonderful to be a part of and to see, uh, and to give this gift to young people, which is a big part of our effort. And Mark and Kayla are educators. Um, there's a lot of educators in the beatboxing community. Uh, and even in my own family, you know, my cousins and my older sister who have kids, um, when I've come around and uh, caught up with them and showed them some of these videos or whatever, I always get videos back from my family members of their children beatboxing and they're sort of like <laughs> candid behind the door, you know, they come in and catch them beatboxing. That's awesome. Um, it's, a, it's a great project. I'm, I'm glad to be involved with it. Awesome. So, uh, so what we're going to do, um, I'm going to get some recommendations from you, and then we're going to do an audience Q&A, and I'll let you uh, get on with your day. Um, so cool. 
if anyone is looking in, into getting into music promotions or any other interest that you have, like, do you have any recommendations like podcasts, books, movies? Like, what are you into? Um, well, there are so many. <laughs> uh, I think, I, I think for me, no matter what you do, uh, it's important to understand how to communicate with people and how to read people and how to, um, timeline, uh, the, the efforts that you have to get things done. So I love the four hour work week is, is great on just talking about how to organize yourself. Tim Ferriss wrote that. Um, that's a, that's a great book just on getting whatever you're doing in your life kind of organized in a way that is conducive to you being as successful as you can be without putting in unnecessary time or wasting a lot of time. Um, uh, how to win friends and influence people is another great book. Um, you know, I mean, probably all of the books that I enjoy are not very specific to how to, how you become a successful event promoter or marketing person. Um, you know, although I do, there are books on guerrilla marketing that I really love. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be learned from, um, taking a guerrilla approach, uh, which for anyone who doesn't know that sort of, uh, you know, a, a covert operation in a sense. Um, so instead of, you know, the billboard, you might go out into the crowd and hand out flyers. That'd be a little more of a guerrilla way to promote, right? But just for people who want to get into events or uh, experiential marketing and things of that nature, there's luckily a ton of examples out there. And there's a ton of festivals to look at. There's a ton of conventions and conferences and tours um, there's a lot of experience based, uh, everything out there right now. Um, you know, and so I think that you can take a lot just from going out and interacting with the world. Another thing I really learned with being in Los Angeles and in Hollywood area is that anytime you go out in that area, you stand to meet I the environment right and that environment contains a lot of very creative people doing very creative things and you can sort of take bits and pieces as influence uh similar to in music where when you're studying music you know you learn first everybody else's style you learn how to do jojo mayer you learn how to do mike portnoy you know you learn these different drummers and their styles and their particular way of doing things or things that are specific to um to the way that they play licks and then you forget, or you don't necessarily forget, but you don't think uh, consciously about playing those licks. You just let them become part of your knowledge base, your pool of knowledge. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that you know, going out to events is one of the best ways to start to know uh, whether you want to be involved in it as well, because you know, at these festivals, uh, you know, I'm not on stage always. Uh, I'm not always hanging out with the artist, you know, when I'm tour managing a band, that's a, that's a really fun gig. Uh, but you have to be the one in the group who is the most on all the time when everybody else is really partying and letting loose. You're the one who has to make sure that, you know, all of the rider requirements have been met and that you get paid at the end of the night and you're paid the right amount and that everybody gets back to the tour bus in time and makes it to the next city on time and that nobody is there that shouldn't be that's going to have to somehow find now a ride back to the city that they came from because they hit on the bus um you know there's just a lot of a lot of elements there um and the same with production you know i just worked Cabo del mar festival which is a great festival in southern california um and you know the whole time there are amazing bands and comedians and all this stuff going on and you only get to catch you know one or song or a couple things here a minute here a minute there um, because you're really, you're in the trenches working, you know, and it's, it's not, um, it's not the worst job out there. Definitely not. Uh, but, um, you know, if you go out, you can start to notice if you've been to a festival before and you're interested in working in festivals, go as a patron. And if you want to be a stage man, Uh, go to that main stage as a patron and stand close as you can and don't watch the band. Watch everybody else moving around and see 
how they're interacting and how they're moving. You know, that's kind of a, a good way to just gain some perspective initially, at least, um, into the way of things. But there's tons of material as well in the, in the way of reading. And so I think if, if anybody does sort of a quick search, um, there's plenty of people that give formulas. However, I will say that, you know, in my opinion, there is no real one formula. There's a loose um, way to produce an event or there are the components of any event. Um, you know, the ticketing, the promotion, the booking, um, the staffing, uh, the recap, you know, uh, the ROI for the sponsors. There are all these basic elements, but for every event, it's very different. The ROI for every sponsor is very different. You know, if you're interested in getting into experiential marketing or marketing of any kind, um, it's, it's always more beneficial to find out what that company wants uh, and not really go at it saying, here's what you should have. Although there is something to be said very much for having a plan and presenting something because oftentimes people are more convincible than they are needy, if that makes sense. Um, you know, and so you kind of have to, in some cases, let people know that this is going to be a good thing for them so that they can become aware of this op opportunity, this option. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a balance. It's, it's, there's, uh, I could go on for hours about, you know, sort of the juxtaposed um, potentials of any of these situations, but more, more so than anything, you know, go to the events, look around at the people who are scurrying around with radios on, see what they're doing, maybe talk to somebody, ask them, you know, how they're doing, how they're feeling, and volunteer. You know, there are endless opportunities to volunteer at these events. Um, they will have, uh, if nothing else. And um, yeah, I mean, tons of festivals out there, more and more every year popping up, it seems. So, um, the good thing about all that is there's uh, a flux of music, you know, and there are a lot of encouragement for people to go out there and be creative and to work creative jobs and um, work within the music industry because it's become so much bigger with the event industry. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's a. Uh, I think you're you're absolutely right. Like volunteering at events um, is is more often than not, um, it leads to something if you keep pursuing it. Like I've heard a lot of stories from people who, who've who gotten a start just volunteering at some of these volunteer events. at just one event, a hundred percent of the time, if you volunteer at one event, you're going to meet people there that work tons of other events. Yep. Uh, and if you're proactive about talking to those people and getting phone numbers, staying in touch, finding out what the next event they're working on. Most of the time they're working on another event next week and the week after that and the week after that. And so, if you're available and you can, uh, you know, get to the place um, and sort out housing, sometimes all those things are offered, sometimes not. But if you can have a bit of tolerance um, and patience and just kind of be willing to, to go um, and to ask, then, yeah, you can definitely find a lot of opportunities. I mean, I, the first time I worked Coachella, I had produced uh, a, a, an event, Lose Control event in South, by Southwest. I was driving back to Los Angeles and uh, I was riding with a buddy of mine, Andrew, who is a rapper by the name of Ocelot. Shout outs to Ocelot. Um, he got a phone call while we were on the drive that uh, he was going to get hired for the guest services department for Coachella that year and that maybe there was an extra position. And he turned to me in the car and was like, hey, would you like to work Coachella? I'm like, uh, when is it? He's like, it's next weekend, but you have to commit to three and a half weeks of work. And at the time, lucky, luckily, you know, I, I had the availability to commit to that. Um, and so I jumped in and across those three weekends of two weekends of Coachella and then Stagecoach, which Golden Voice also produced on the same grounds uh, the next weekend after Coachella weekend two. You know, I met all these production people. There are a thousand employees for Golden Voice at, you know, the Coachella and Stagecoach festivals. Um, and then there's everybody, uh, you know, who are leading these departments and all the people under them and all those people under them work different festivals and different departments at different festivals. And so that was such a launch pad for me. Um, and also, if you don't suck, then you come back every year, right? And so you, you kind of 
pick up the breadcrumbs along the way. You work that first festival as a volunteer, you do great, you know, they want you back again, maybe you can get a paid position next year. Um, and then before you know it, you're three or four years in and you have seniority because most people are volunteers and they only kind of come out for one year or maybe a couple of times. Um, you know, so if, if you want this to be your regular job, it's definitely easy, I would say, to jump in in a manner of speaking, as long as you're willing to kind of put forth the work, be open minded um, and kind of take whatever position that you can, because once you're there, you can meet everybody from every other position and start to kind of find the best one that works for you. Awesome. All right. Let's get to the Q&A because we got some coming in. Cool. All right. Uh, first one EDC is crazy. What did you do there? Yeah, it is crazy. So I've done a few things. I've uh, worked with the merchandise department there and managed some of the different merch areas. Uh, in years past, I've worked with the artist transportation team uh, as well and the artist relations team. And I sort of have some uh, new endeavors with them uh, for the coming years. But it is a crazy festival. It's one of my favorite festivals to work um and as i have i've been working all these festivals for about seven years now and i've let go of some of the other extraneous ones uh that i used to do in years past and have really focused in on festivals that offer a very sort of among them a, a diverse array of genre and you know uh, market the people that are there and uh edc vegas particularly is absolutely insane they they are one of the most expensive festivals i think they spend around 60 million dollars to produce mm -hmm. that event and uh they especially spend a ton of that budget on art and on creatives um you know the stages there are insanely extravagant uh they're all built by artists or hand handmade you know um and then there are hundreds of circus performers you know and literally they have these individuals pitch their their act, um, and if they get approved, they get a stipend to come out. Be there um, to perform, so it's really like a circus, and it's such a fun environment for that reason. Uh, it's very very much like a, a party series that I intended to throw back in the day. I, I did a, a series called Vinyl Warehouse, and my interest was to grow that event into having you know, suspended cages and go-go dancers dressed as zoo animals and lots of just very, it was, it was a very extravagant conversation back in the day, but then looking at, you know, sort of EDC Vegas as an example, um, you know, they, they really take that to the max. Um, so yeah, I love that. Love that group. Awesome. Good festival. Uh, what's the wildest event you've ever organized? The wildest event I've ever organized. Um, South by Southwest is probably up there. Um, the Loose Control event and the two years before I started producing Loose Control, um, I was managing a venue that had three stages and we had daytime and nighttime events. So, you know, there would be a, basically a half a dozen shows every day among these three stages and each of those shows would have anywhere from a dozen to three dozen artists on the bill um and there's food elements and art elements uh you know painted art and and projection art and lots of different stuff so south by is is always very very crazy um if i had to pinpoint one experience that was the craziest oh man it's so hard um Definitely got stories for days from South by Southwest, but maybe one of the one of the most crazy would be when I was producing an event for World Star, um, and we had the entire freshman XXL uh, on our lineup that night, and uh, so uh, World Star team arrived the day before, and we're flyering the streets and selling tickets in the streets. They oversold the event by like three times the capacity of the venue um, and basically just kept selling tickets, telling everybody that just because you buy a ticket doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to get in. But of course, everybody was just like, you know, screw it, I'm gonna buy anyway. But so what that turned into was the night of the event, the front door 
uh, which is facing on Sixth Street in Austin, Texas, during South by Southwest, the entire block for one block outside of the door in each direction was shoulder to shoulder people. There's the cops who came later on told us that they thought there was around 5,000 people standing outside um, of this 1,000 capacity venue. Um, and in the back door, all the artists are trying to get in, right? And this is like, you know, futures there, Cameron's there, designer is there, um, you know, XYZ, other artists, tons of little Yachty, tons of them. Anyway, so they're all coming in through this back door. And of course, some of those 5,000 people on the front are aware of the layout of South by and know that there are these alleys behind the venue. So probably like three or 400 of those people are back at the back door trying to catch a glimpse of somebody famous showing up or to nudge their way into the venue through the back door. And so it was just absolute insanity. At one point, two people who were on the lineup had been having beef. And so my job, you know, I'm, I'm producing the event, but at that one point in the night, the back door, I'm hearing from my security that it's just, it's not going down back there. You know, these rappers are bringing in heat and they're not say, taking no for an answer, you know, whatever. So I go back there, I start running the back door and, and just pushing their way through hundreds of people, first of all. Um, and then coming through and I'm having to tell them, no, you can't bring these guns, these straps, you, you gotta go take that back outside, you know, I'm sorry. Um, and just, yeah, that, that whole night, there are a lot, of, a lot of moments from that night. That was one of, probably one of the craziest events that I've put together just because the sheer madness of the crowd and all of the hype that was around all of the artists um, was just so big. You know, every press outlet was there and hitting us up and trying to, get guaranteed access and seeing if they could get interview and you know there's no smoking uh substances in texas although now it's decriminalized this is right before that happened it's always been a bit um uh looked the other way upon down there but it's definitely you know illegal and so the police who are coming to shut us down for the issue that we're causing in the street also, the upstairs is the green room because there are so many artists and it, it looks like you, know, you can't even see the ceiling. You know, it looks like it's about to rain up there is how much smoke it's like cloudy, you know. So, um, yeah, it was that was a crazy that was a crazy experience. One of the craziest events, I'd have to say. That is nuts. Um, <laughs> wow. So do you ever scout people on YouTube to find talent for your shows? Definitely. Um, you know, I own a lot of different um, help, help in different ways, I guess. A lot of different people, a lot of different resources. Um, I, I read a lot of the outlets, the news outlets for music and look at who's popping and who's budding. Um, there are definitely a lot of sources out there to see who's uh, in the underground and who's in the street kind of emerging. Um, I'd say probably my number one way of discovering new artists is going to a specific number of friends that I have who crack out on individual genres you know like I've got one good friend who's just uh like a new wave I guess and like a psych rock and you know kind of these like poppy uh synthy and different versions anyway in those in those elements and then I've got a buddy of mine who is like the hip hop dictionary. Like he just knows everybody from hip hop, rap, mumble rap, trap. I mean, he is just, I don't understand where he, how he stays so on top of everything. But um, so yeah, so I try to do that. And then through the events is the other way that I really stay up on stuff. Working all these festivals, you know, Coachella has hundreds of artists on different stages and I don't know all of them, certainly. So, um, you know, I work, a dozen or a dozen and a half festivals each year and I look at those lineups and I say okay who are these people who are those people what's going on uh, do I like this music you know do I think that it fits with this or that event um, and so yeah eventually it brings me to their YouTube or their Spotify or something like that but I don't necessarily just search those uh, places for new music specifically cool um, what is your favorite part of what you do 
tough. Um, maybe the travel, I think, is probably one of the, the most fun things. As a musician, I always was excited to tour the world and travel and see places and meet. Um, you know, I've in the different work environments that I've had, I've been to other countries and other continents and, um, you know, I've interacted with people from all walks of life and got to interface with people who are household names, you know, and have real conversations with those people and have sort of a, um, a an experience that isn't hyped by who they are or the environment. Um, and that is really possible through the traveling, you know, this industry requires a lot of movement and, uh, if you can figure out the right hacks, so it doesn't cost so much money, um, or work with companies that pay for you to be traveling around and be involved, then yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I think traveling is something that everyone should do. I'm such an advocate of it. Um, you know, people think that it's such a financial hurdle and it can be, there are, you know, some ways that you can lessen that hurdle. Um, you know, and, and I am very open-minded to those ways because I think traveling is the ultimate goal and, uh, uh, you know, seeing different parts of the world, especially being paid to do it. Uh, I'm not arguing, I'm not mad at that at all. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Two more. What would you say cool. to someone who thinks college will be a waste of time for their interests? Depends on their interests. I, I, you know, there was a time in my life where I was like, just go to college no matter what, uh, because, you know, get the degree. Um, I, I still would argue for going to college, not for the degree, but for the life experience. Um, learning to deal with people and, and just, um, being forced to, you know, handle other people's shit and, and, you know, go through difficult situations, you know, um, it's just training, you know, and not everybody needs it. There's certainly ways to make money, um, out there, you know, that you don't, I mean, there's, I just read an article about a girl who has an abnormally long, long tongue. And, you know, she makes $200,000 a year uh, on her Instagram through sponsorships and other things or whatever, you know, because she has a long tongue. Like, it's a weird what? world that we live in these days, you know. Um, you don't need to go to school, but I think being educated is important. Or out in the world, um, I think the, the better chances you have of being successful. One of the things that I realized in my experience when I travel around, I, you know, so many people are uh, horrible spellers, right? Or um, they're just grammatically deft. You know, they 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 don't understand. You know, uh, things that I learned as basic building blocks. You know, you know, to to life, to forming sentences and to writing and you know different these things like that. I always but. For that, for that example, you know, these are people who are very successful. And so there are always examples of people who did not go the formal education route and who became very successful because formal education is not required to become very successful. No, and, it and, and like we, we've said on here before, um, I think time management is one of the major yeah. things that you can, you can get from college because when it, when it gets crunch Definitely. time, you have to learn how to balance all that stuff. So. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's important to, to know, I think, um, your own capacity. It's very much dependent on what you want to do. But, um, you know, if you're going into skilled professions, you, know, you, you need to go through those years. Um, you know, if you also are uh, endeavorous to start a project or start a company or travel or go, then go do that, in my opinion. Go do that first. Try it out. School will always be there. It will never be as easy to go to school as it is the year after your senior year because you're just already your entire life. You just go to the next year of school. Um, and I think it's easier to do that. But I would say also I'm in my 30s now and I want to go back to school. I've always been uh, excited to learn cool ideas. I don't know what I would go back to school for, but, you know, I love the thought of it more now than I certainly did when I was in school the first time. So uh, it depends on the person and situation. 
Awesome. And last question, then we'll let you get out of here. Uh, somebody's a really a big fan into looping beatbox artists. So what's your, who is your favorite looping beatbox artist? Oh, boy. All right. So I could have like a separate question, probably. Um, I am a huge fan of looping. And in the beatboxing community, I think that it's going to be the thing that breaks beatboxers into the mainstream. Uh, with DJs and even with bands now, people are used to seeing looping. They're used to um, having that technology and uh, beatboxers are really, really getting crazy with it. There's a guy called So So who I really love. MB14 is uh, an amazing, amazing loop guy and uh, he's actually going to be one of our judges. I just leaked that uh, for anybody who's an American beatbox fan. We're not supposed to have that information out there, so you get it here first. Um, but, uh, you know, he's really great. Um, and I think there are just maybe a dozen more that I could say um, that are really great. The Grand Beatbox Battle uh, has a lot of great videos on YouTube, uh, Loop Station Battles there. Um, and so, yeah, I would just say maybe go over there and check out some of some of those, see who MB14 and SoSo have battled, and you can sort of uh, discover a, a few handfuls more just really, really talented guys. And there's some that do sort of the, um, the cover song, right? They can build a song uh, with the loop station that is a cover, or they'll build it backwards, and then when they reverse it, then you hear the, the cover song come through. Um, and then there are other artists who... Uh, just create amazing original music. One, uh, another, I'll give you a third guy called Saro, uh, S-A-R-O. He's amazing uh, as well. So Saro, Soso, and that's actually MB14, uh, is a 14, is French guy, but MB14. Um, those three are really, really great Loop Station beatboxers. Um, and I'll also give a, a huge shout out to Kayla Milady, who's uh, also one of the producers of the American Beatbox Championships and American Beatbox with me. She is the two-time female world champion beatboxer, um, and she really does a lot of cool stuff with, uh, with the Loop Station, too. So there's a few to check out. That's awesome, man. Um, so go ahead and plug everything. Where can they find you? Shout out all the sites and, and everything that you got going on. Cool. Um, I'm on Instagram at mr underscore x n d r Mr. Xander. Uh, go check out theticketfairy.com uh, and americanbeatbox.com. And my site is zandali.com, which has links to all of those as well as links to the Loose Control. Uh, and that is x a n d a l i.com. Got it, man. Well, thank you so much for coming and spending uh, my birthday with me. And uh, I hope to yeah, talk to you again happy soon. Birthday, man. Yeah, Absolutely. Man. And salute to health. I'm drinking water. Yeah, but to I got your you. health. I'm right here with you, man. Right here with you. <laughs> Respect. All right, buddy. <laughs> well, have a much good love, one, man. man. And we'll, we'll catch up again soon, okay? Absolutely, brother. Thank All you. Right. All right, man. Have a good one. You too. Peace. Bye. La opinión es como el todos tenemos una y creemos que es el más bonito. Yes, I said it.